Hi, welcome to another episode of Arbitral Voices, a videocast series with the Institute for Transnational Arbitration. Today, we're lucky enough to have with us Marnie Cheek. Hi, Marnie. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. So Marnie is the co-chair of International Arbitration and Disputes Practice at Covington and Burley. She advises companies, governments, and NGOs on international disputes and legal strategy. Her practices include commercial arbitration, investment treaty arbitration, public international law, business and human rights, and international trade. Most recently, she's been focusing on representing the government of Ukraine in two landmark cases before the ICJ and versus the Russian Federation. Before Covington, she was Associate General Counsel at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Marnie is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and serves as Vice President of the American Society on International Law. Did I get that right, Marnie? Yes, you did. Good. So let's start with your uh, background at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, much of our work in international investment law and public international law <laughs> involves just deciphering what treaties mean. You have some experience on the other side of the equation actually writing these treaties. So what was it like doing the writing instead of the reading? How does that influence your work afterwards? It really influenced uh, my work a lot um, in that when I was at USTR, uh, one of my main roles was drafting treaty text. Mm. And there were really four aspects to that. One, uh, figuring out like what we want the obligation to say mm. or to be, drafting text that reflected the obligation, then negotiating with the other side, which usually le led to uh, a different text entirely. And then four, once you had this final text that was agreed to the parties, we would do a, quote, legal scrub to make sure that that uh, language seemed to reflect a clear, unambiguous obligation, which really dovetails into much of the work you do in investment treaty arbitration or, or other public international law work related to treaty interpretation, because certainly um, one part, important part of my job uh, was making sure that our obligations were clear and unambiguous. And of course, the customary international law principles of treaty interpretation that are reflected in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which everyone's familiar with, um, they dictate that you start with the ordinary meaning of the language and context. Um, and that was really very much a guiding principle when we were drafting treaty language to make sure that it, it was clear. And of course, there are supplemental means of treaty interpretation, um, but our goal really was to ensure that where there was a meeting of the minds between the parties, that was clearly reflected um, in the treaty text. And I think when I'm involved in cases, certainly um, that mindset and really focusing in the first instance on the ordinary meaning of the language and context, I think it's fundamentally important because ideally uh, you should be able to stop the analysis there if the, the treaty was, was well drafted to figure out you know, what, where there was a meeting of the minds in terms of the obligation that's there. And I might actually just share an, one anecdote. Um, when I was at USTR, we were involved in negotiating many free trade agreements at once. Uh, these were multi-chapter agreements, and I worked as the lawyer on many different chapters, environment, intellectual property, and other issues. So uh, we had some treaty language that had come to a close. Uh, the negotiators had reached agreement. Um, and so the last step of the process is what we used to call the legal scrub. And the legal scrub is when the lawyers read through the text and look for certain things. If I'm using a treaty term, have I used it consistently across the entire treaty so that it means the same thing here in chapter four that it also means in chapter eight? Um, if there's some specialized meaning, because it's a term of art in this particular area of telecommunications, for example, is that clear? Or do we need a footnote to that effect? Um, but also, does it make sense? Is it obvious what the parties did agree to? And I remember one time there was this very ambiguous sentence, and I thought, okay, actually, that sentence could mean A or it could mean B. But I, I know we meant A, so I'm going to just change the language a little bit. You're not supposed to be changing the obligation, but you're supposed to just be clarifying the language. So in the future... If there is a dispute, everyone knows that the 
ordinary meaning of the language reflected the meeting of the minds of the parties. So I changed it. And I went to my client, the, the policy negotiator, and I said, this is what we meant, right? I, I changed the language to mean this because it was really ambiguous in the treaty text you landed on at the negotiating table. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. We, um, we know it's ambiguous, but that was kind of the point. Like, they wanted it to mean one thing, and we wanted it to mean another. So we agreed to this ambiguous language. And I thought, okay, I'm pretty sure that's not how we're supposed to do things. So I went to my boss, and I explained, like, well, they purposely left it ambiguous. And he was like, no, that is not how we negotiate treaties, right? Um, so, uh, and of course, the Vienna Convention has rules. So if the language is ambiguous, you can look at these supplemental means of interpretation. But certainly as a drafter, you, you don't want to draft something that's ambiguous. So, so I think all this experience kind of informs the way that I read treaties now. So it's true ambiguity breeds consent. So what do you miss most or least about working for government? Well, what I miss most is probably um, the camaraderie and just the level of activity. You know, here in private practice, we have, up, we have ups and downs in terms of if we're in a war room all together or we're having a series of, you know, interesting calls. But in government, I was never alone. I shared an office. I had meetings with my client offices. I had meetings interagency with other international lawyers from different agencies to try to reach consensus on a U.S. position. I had meetings with my counterparts in, in other countries. And so there was probably just a lot more engagement on, like, on an everyday basis. And sometimes I miss that. Everyone says the law firm is much quieter I see. Than, than government practice. So... You unusually have both an in, a very active international arbitration practice and also an international trade practice. So uh, I want to discuss a little bit about that. What do you get from each? And do you feel there's synergies there or do you mentally just keep them separate? I really think there's real synergies and, and here's why. Um, a lot of my trade practice, international trade practice is advisory but it's still looking at treaty obligations. It's just looking at international trade obligations rather than say maybe investment protections or another treaty. Um, and so some of the exercise is similar. I'd say the biggest difference is my arbitration practice is contentious. At that point, you have a dispute, um, often a very important dispute with a very important business or political ramifications. Um, whereas on the trade policy practice, um, really it's trying to solve a problem, a policy problem using international law and international trade tools, but to try to solve a problem short of litigation. And so I think certainly in the, in the trade practice, knowing what litigation looks like down the road, I think that that helps inform uh, the strategy to try to solve a problem. Um, and similarly, on the arbitration side of my practice, um, I think it's helpful to kind of know, understand everything that came before and the complex interests a company or a country has before they actually decide to get to the dispute space. So I find them very complementary, and there's a lot of synergies in terms of how you're approaching issues. Well, let's zoom in a little on the arbitration practice. You also act as an arbitrator, right? I do, yes. So how does that affect or inform uh, your practice as counsel? Does it change your perspective at all? You know, I remember a good friend who sits as an arbitrator quite regularly saying to me that, you know, he really hates it when parties file 200-page briefs okay. and... Having filed 200 page briefs myself, sometimes you feel like there's so many issues, we have no page limits, and so 200 pages it is. Um, but I will say, sitting as an arbitrator, I'm a bit sympathetic to the notion that if you are going to flood a tribunal with material, then you need to at least have a very good written ro roadmap, oral roadmap at the hearing to kind of help 
the tribunal separate the wheat from the chafe and, and understand the core issues. And if you're not able to do that, I think it is to your detriment because counsel is always going to know the case better than the arbitrators do. And so unless you can guide the arbitrators through this huge voluminous record, um, you know, there's kind of risks involved um, because you're asking three people or five people in a state to state arbitration, perhaps to just um, absorb a lot of information. So it makes me as a practitioner realize that that roadmap is very important to help guide the arbitrators to what your side thinks are the key issues. And of course, the other side will do the same. And I think if both sides do that, it can really facilitate um, adjudication um, by the tribunal. Now, at the start, we said you are co-head of uh, Covington's International Arbitration Disputes Practice. Can you pinpoint a proudest moment you have in that role? Proudest moment? I think that really would be our representation of Ukraine. So we've represented Ukraine since 2015 um, after uh, Russia invaded and occupied Crimea. Um, and uh, the issues that they've brought, the international disputes that they've brought against the Russian Federation, I think have been a really important part of, of their strategy. Um, there have been many proud moments along the way, but I think when we uh, went to the International Court of Justice just two days after Russia's full-scale invasion in February 2022, and were able to obtain very strong provisional measures against Russia on behalf of Ukraine, um, that was a really, really proud moment because in the first week of that full-scale invasion, the world thought maybe Kiev would fall. And I think the Ukrainian people are resilient, they're smart, they're practical, they understand international law. Um, and it was just a very proud moment to, to be a part of that when they you know, went to the world court uh, to try to seek justice on those issues. How did you come to represent Ukraine? Uh, so that's an that's, uh, interesting story. There's not that many law firms at the time Ukraine was looking for counsel who didn't do a fair amount of work for the Russian Federation, either for the government itself or for some of its large state-owned enterprises that are under the control of the government. Um, and a lot of Western uh, law firms also had open offices in Moscow. Uh, Covington didn't have any of those things. We were involved in some of the very first arbitrations against uh, the Russian Federation related to Yukos oil company and the expropriation of Yukos. And for that reason, we had been adverse to the Russian Federation for a very long time. Uh, Covington's uh, business strategy was never to open an office in Moscow, so there wasn't an, an issue there. Um, and uh, we just had a very strong track record of winning against Russia. So I think uh, for all those reasons, uh, we were um, a strong potential candidate to represent Ukraine. And then what I talked about before about the fact that uh, I think we take a very holistic approach um, to problem solving. And certainly for Ukraine, uh, there's a lot of issues and a lot of international legal issues that they're working through um, adverse to the Russian Federation. But I think the way that we view disputes, which is we understand they're part of a broader policy process, um, I also think fit very much into Ukraine's agenda and their goals. Good. I, you have a family connection to Ukraine as well, right? I do. I do. Uh, my great grandmother, who actually was alive when I was little, um, we used to always say she was from Russia, but she's really actually from Odessa, Ukraine. So. Um, I do have that family connection. And in fact, my great grandfather's family also was from uh, Ukraine. So uh, my family immigrated to the United States um, from Ukraine uh, when it was part of the Russian Empire around the turn of the 20th century when there were pogroms against 
uh, Jews in many small towns and large towns uh, in the Russian Empire. And so they they came to the U.S. But I had the good fortune of being able to travel to Odessa, uh, Ukraine, for um, work-related reasons related to one of our cases. And um, that was just a, an extra delight, uh, given that that is actually where my family was originally from. <laughs> my grandparents are also from uh, Odessa. Uh, now, we said it at the start, you've been representing Ukraine in two of these landmark cases uh, before the ICJ. What can you tell us about that? So the first case we launched in 2017 focused on violations of the Terrorism Financing Convention and the Convention for Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Um, that was a case that was ongoing for many years. It involved a lot of evidence. Um, and uh, in the first instance, we also re- uh, Ukraine got pro- uh, provisional measures in that case from the court. Uh, Ukraine also prevailed on jurisdiction. And when Russia lost on its jurisdictional objections, it became the first time that Russia ever had to answer mm. Uh, before the International Court of Justice on the merits of a case, um, which was extremely significant. And ultimately, um, in a decision um, this past February, the court found that Russia had violated its obligations under both of those international treaties, which is the first time that Russia had ever been found by the world court to violate international law. And I think that's a very important milestone um, and important to international law uh, feels very much under threat right now. Um, and I think it's really uh, fundamental that a government uh, like the Russian Federation is not above the law um, and will be held accountable when it violates international law. The second case is under the Genocide Convention and proceeded uh, shortly after the full-scale invasion, as I mentioned. Um, you know, that case focuses on the fact that Russia's excuse for the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 was to prevent a genocide. You may recall this rhetoric about how they're Nazis and we need to denazify Ukraine. Um, and that rhetoric actually had been going on for a long time, just maybe not as much seen in the Western press. Um, and so the case focuses on the fact that those allegations are, are a lie and you can't throw the term genocide around like that, particularly to justify uh, invading another country and and invading, uh, uh, defying territorial sovereignty um, based on those kinds of lies. And so the case really focuses on that. And again, the court has found it has jurisdiction over the case. And so it's proceeding uh, to to the merits, um, which right now are being briefed. So um, that case is, is somewhat different from the first case Ukraine brought before the ICJ because it's narrower. <laughs> um, it focuses on a, a kind of discrete set of issues, um, but also it has an unprecedented 32 countries who are parties to the Genocide Convention who have intervened, um, and their view of the Genocide Convention and Russia's violations are largely consistent with uh, the way Ukraine has been pleading the case. So. To have that many parties feel that they have a keen interest in the outcome of this contentious dispute between Ukraine and Russia, I also think has actually been uh, um, the tip of the iceberg in terms of some of the more recent cases that we're now seeing before the ICJ as well. And you referred to Ukraine's recent results, these recent results uh, before the ICJ as a legal and moral victory. What do you mean by that? Well, certainly as a legal victory, as I mentioned, um, you know, the the court was clear that that Russia is in violation of its international legal obligations. But I think also as a as a moral victory, because, um, you know, for Russia, international law um, gets twisted. Mm -hmm. Uh, They use it as a sword where they can, as well as a shield, um, really undermining some of the kind of fundamental core principles of international law. And so I think it was a moral victory that a small country like Ukraine can stand up to a larger country like Russia, who's abusing its international power and therefore abusing and flouting international law 
And so there's a real moral victory in that, in that as well. Like there's something to that judgment that I think is truly fundamental about uh, principles of the rule of law that are, that are important and, and soundly support Ukraine. Now, these state-to-state -state cases before the ICJ can take years. What do you say to those who question why go to the ICJ at all? It's true. Uh, the wheels of justice turn slowly uh, sometimes. Um, but um, actually, Ukraine's second case under the Genocide Convention has moved um, incredibly, incredibly quickly, at least by uh, ICJ standards. Um, and sometimes these processes take a long time, but I think it's not a reason to abandon those processes at all. And I see Ukraine really as a, as a leader in that area in, in seeking international justice. Um, and I think, you know, if you don't try, then uh, it seems you can violate international law with, with impunity. So I think it's important to, even if it will take long, uh, to embark on that, on that journey. Yeah, I see that. Now, your practice isn't solely based on ICJ and public international law. You also have an active investment treaty arbitration uh, practice. Now, it's no secret that investment treaty arbitration has come under some pretty widespread criticism for a decade, and it's been unable to shake off uh, that criticism. What's your take? Is there some truth to this criticism? Is there still room today for investment treaty arbitration? I think there's certainly room for investment treaty arbitration, and I think it's needed for a couple of reasons. Well, first, let me start maybe with the one of the criticisms. I'd say one of the criticisms I think that is valid it relates to transparency. Yeah. Um, in some of these older cases, um, there really isn't much transparency. And so in cases where there is a public interest, um, it's possible that some members of the public you know, don't really know kind of the outcomes. Um, so I think transparency is important. I think that some countries and more recent agreements really have made great strides on transparency. Certainly U.S. agreements provide for a lot of transparency with open hearings, et cetera, like you would in U.S. court. And I think that's a benefit because it also demystifies the process and some of the other criticisms which are less valid I think you can see with your own eyes the more you uh, make the whole process transparent. So I think transparency is important and parties should still be striving for that, um, that transparency. Um, but the reason I think investor state disputes, investment treaty disputes really are so important is that um, a government's not gonna wanna bring every claim. It's not gonna wanna espouse the claim of every one of its nationals who has suffered some kind of um, unfair and inequitable treatment or suffered an expropriation. It's a political calculation. Mm -hmm. And if you take, going back to Yukos Oil Company example, uh, there were Spanish investors who were able to bring a case against Russia. There were UK investors who were able to bring a case against Russia. There were investors able to bring case under the Energy Charter Treaty against Russia. But Americans don't have an investment treaty with Russia. And so Americans had to rely on their government uh, to reach some kind of negotiated solution if the government would espouse those claims. And if you're part of a broader uh, political and geopolitical dynamic, your country's not always going to you know, raise every claim um, that actually might be quite uh, meritorious. And so I think that allowing investors to be able to raise these claims on their own um, is very significant because many of these claims are meritorious. I think companies do not take lightly uh, the ramifications of deciding to sue the government that's hosting their investment. Um, but many of those cases, just for geopolitical reasons, uh, wouldn't be able to be resolved without uh, investor state dispute settlement. So I think it's a really important part of the accountability ecosystem. <laughs> Just one more question. What has this experience with Ukraine taught you about international law? Has it changed your perspective at all? Um, you know, I'm very inspired by my Ukrainian colleagues in that I think they fundamentally 
believe in international law. Mm. And from my perspective, sometimes international law feels very academic. Yeah. I mean, there's like thousands and thousands of law review articles written on this topic or that topic. Uh, but international law is not necessarily academic. And when uh, there's people committing, you know, war crimes on the battlefield and people are losing their lives and uh, international law has just a fundamentally important role to play. So I think, you know, international law is a very important practical uh, disciplining force. Um, and I think the international legal community needs to make sure we're rallying um, behind that because we can all write a lot of blog posts, you know, to theorize about this or that and poke holes, you know, and the reasoning of this or that. But, you know, at the end of the day, we really need international law to provide a framework for the world order. And I think when you see what's happening in Ukraine, that's incredibly tangible. And so... If anything, it's renewed my faith in international law and inspired me to try to help uh, strengthen that system when it certainly is facing, um, you know, attacks from many directions at the moment. Marty, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you for joining us.